So you mentioned that Kanban, of course, is still a must, right? So you wrote this book, Personal Kanban. You have two rules about personal Kanban. Maybe you can brief us for people who also would like to figure out how best they should spend their work or their life or maybe mm -hmm. reduce the number of things that they need to do. Because I personally, really? in this digital modern life, have so many things to do, so many opportunities to learn, but also at the same time, so many things that I wish I want to do. Tell us more about these two rules of personal Kanban. So the two rules for personal Kanban are visualize your work because you can better manage what you can see. So if you can't see it, it's really hard to keep track of it. It's just kind of that simple. And the second rule is to limit your work in progress. So we tend to start lots of things and not finish them. So we'll start five, six, 12 things at a time, and they're all in flight in one way or another. And what happens when we do that is we don't stop thinking about it. It's in our brains. It's using up our mental capacity, our cognitive capacity. It's decreasing the amount of capacity that we can use to focus on other things. So if you take just one thing, you're remembering who it's for, when it's due, what you've done so far, who you're working on it with, what you've used, what you've learned, how you've deviated from your original plans, when it's due, how angry people are going to get when you're not done with it. The list just goes on and on. One day I tried to list everything that you had to think to remember about a task and I ran out of paper. <laughs> It just went on and on and on. So finally, I just put, you know, dot, dot, dot. So there's a lot of variables that we remember that we don't think about because they just seem normal to us. But if you start loading on five or six or 10 things, you become very weighed down by that. So we want to limit your work in progress, the things that you're doing right now to one, two or three things. And then that way you can focus on them and finish them with quality and then move on to the next thing. So I'm sure many people would have seen Kanban, maybe like what you mentioned in Jira or in Miro or some other it tools. Those uh, tools that took our ideas and did a very sloppy job of implementing them, yes. <laughs> but <laughs> normally they would see it in their work. So I rarely see people who have this personal Kanban. Mostly mm -hmm. what people do is to-do list. So why do we need to build personal Kanban for ourselves versus just doing it in to-do list? So just really quickly, the format of the personal Kanban is that you have stuff you haven't done yet, stuff you're doing, and stuff that you've completed. That sounds obvious. <laughs> it sounds like, well, of course you would, but no other system actually has that. So if you have a to-do list, what happens is you write down a bunch of stuff that you might do. And then when you're done with it, you like violently cross it out. Ah, you kill it dead. And then if you do that, you don't remember you did it. So that thing about remembering, thinking about all the work that we have on our plate, that's called the Zygarnik effect. And there are two parts of the Zygarnik effect. Once we start something, we don't stop thinking about it. But the other part of it is when we finish something, we get closure, we move on and we forget we did it. So the Kanban, it provides you with a clear list of things that are coming up. It helps you focus on the things you're doing now, but it also provides you with a clear list of things you already did. And then you can go back and look at that and say, did I like doing these things? Was the experience good? Was this horrible? Did this happen on time? Did it not happen on time? I mean, agile teams are famous for not doing this. They set up a set of story points for something they're about to work on. They work on it and then they're like, yeah, I'm done. <laughs> but they don't go back and say, was that 13 really a 13 or was that three really a three? Making story points entirely meaningless and velocity even more meaningless. So unless we actually go back and interrogate the work that we did, we're never going to plan effectively for work in the future. So I can see also this retrospective reflection part, not just doing for the sake of doing, checking things off from the to-do list, but also mm -hmm. the reflection part. Did you enjoy the card that you just did? Not just for work, but also for your personal life. But you mentioned in the beginning that we are drowned by this. So many opportunities and to do things that we want to do. I'm sure like for myself, I have things to read, things to watch, things to learn about. So how do we manage all this? Do we need to keep our backlog as well? How do you advise us here? So work is very individual, which is why. If someone comes and tells you, like, we've developed one way to develop software, 
David Allen will tell you he's developed one way, a universal tool to manage your personal work. In fact, it says that in the beginning of getting things done. I have developed the universal way. No, you haven't. <laughs> and just like, you know, Scrum is not a universal way to develop software. The work is unique and work is unique from day to day and minute to minute. There's stuff in our work that we know is going to happen. And in Lean, we call that standard work. And then there's stuff that's weird. David Snowden might call that complexity or something very complicated. We need to understand that those two things are real. So we want to set up a Kanban or a personal Kanban or our backlog to reflect that some of the things in that backlog we absolutely know are going to go perfectly fine. On any given day, I know the blog posts that I'm going to write, I'm going to be able to write it and post it and everything is going to be fine. When I'm launching a new advertising campaign, there's a lot of that that I have no idea what's going to happen. So when you're looking at your backlog, people tend to look at it like, I've got a bunch of tasks. So what we did at Spotify at one point, when we realized that this was becoming a problem, was we took the column for their backlog in their Kanban, and we divided it up into four sections. One section was kitten. The next section was crocodile. The next section after that was zombie. And the fourth one was zombie crocodile. And then we said, okay, Based on how much this ticket scares you, put it in the backlog. <laughs> and there was a bunch of kittens and there were some crocodiles and there were some zombies and there were some zombie crocodiles. So what we knew then was as professionals, there was stuff in there that freaked them right out. And you couldn't schedule that work like you schedule anything else. And what was even funnier was initially they had used story points to estimate them and there was no correlation. There were things that were 13s that were in the easy, there were things in the kitten, and there were things in the zombie crocodile that were like twos or threes. So ask yourself when you're setting out your backlog, what is it that's about to happen to me? If there's a lot of unknowns in that, A, give yourself more time, B, find someone at least to pair with, if not to mob with. Understand that the more those things become complex or the more those things become difficult, the more they need to be collaborative. That's a pretty big pro tip for the PK 101, I know. But the biggest failure I see is people will pull over three incredibly difficult things to do at once and then they'll drown. They'll just drown.